Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. All too often, when we encounter an interesting subject and would like to know more about it, we have to rely on official records, historical accounts, and other secondhand sources. But once in a while, we get lucky. We find an interesting subject that we want to know more about, and we are able to get first-hand accounts of the inside story. Today is one of those lucky days. We have found two old hands who are well-equipped to provide us with first-hand insights. What's more, when it comes to knowledgeable old hands, they don't get much handier than these two. And let's face it, they don't get much older either. <laughs> uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I have the, in, the privilege to introduce two of the best old hands in the business, Ron Gibb and Roy Martin. This is a rare opportunity uh, to document uh, a development of the reconnaissance in the F-5. I was hired in 1966 to support the first camera installation on F-5 and uh, uh, ended up being involved in every version of the reconnaissance uh, of F-5s. And then it was also the project engineer on the RF-5E. And uh, uh, it was a 32-year program. I'm going to talk about the history and the design, and then uh, Roy's going to talk about uh, what uh, really happened after they got to fly it. The discussion subjects are a little background. Uh, the early reconnaissance in the F-5A, which uh, the RF and the Canadian and, and the F-5E, uh, the influence that we had on Vietnam, on the design and decisions on the RF-5E, and then uh, the Northrop-funded demo and full-scale production, uh, the Saudi program with the LORAP, uh, Singapore co-production, and uh, then we did a GPS upgrade in Saudi in the late 90s. Then Roy's going to talk about uh, the flight test operations for all of this activity. I'd like to introduce Roy Martin, who is the chief test pilot for Northrop. He has been key to the development of the RF-5E and has been uh, one of the key pilots for all the uh, flight test activity at Edwards uh, and the development of the aircraft. Roy? My name's Roy Martin. I was test pilot for Northrop Grumman uh, since 1982. I retired last year, and then two weeks ago I got a call to come back. So I'm <laughs> back working with Scale Composites right now, helping out a little bit uh, while they train up some more test pilots. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, various subjects all related to flight test. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail right now on this other than to say we're going to talk about the test, we're going to talk about ferrying the airplanes to the foreign countries, and then we'll talk about some of the in-country training and, and some of the issues that, uh, that we had related to that. So I hope you find it kind of a fun brief. Um, Northrop, uh, as many of you know, have a, uh, a, a policy of not only telling a customer, a potential customer, how good the product's going to be, but showing them with demo aircraft. And it was no different with the uh, RF-5E as a uh, uh, Northrop uh, internally funded the RF-5E demo aircraft. Um, my predecessor on this project was George Myers. I talked to him the other day. He apologizes he couldn't be here, but uh, he did want to pass on that uh, he really, really enjoyed flying the uh, two years that he flew this airplane. Uh, he wanted to also recognize the value of a gentleman named Clyde Voss who was a good friend of T.V. Jones. Clyde Voss had been a uh, fighter pilot in World War II and a recce pilot in, the, in Korea, and his reconnaissance background uh, was such that he knew that the F-5E model would be an excellent reconnaissance platform, and so he kind of pushed for Northrop to do this uh, funded effort. Uh, George then flew uh, the first flight uh, in January of 79. Uh, he then tra uh, trained all, uh, I should say trained, he then demoed the airplane to all the 19 different uh, countries of pilots that came over to fly the plane. A couple words on that in a minute. He also took it to Paris Air Show uh, in May of 79, and a couple of words on that. The uh, profile that George developed was kind of unique when you look at it. Edwards is a unique uh, test center. Uh, you can go up to Mount Whitney area, one of the highest points in the United States, 
and go over mountainous terrain with piney woods, or you can go down to the Edwards area and be over desert in just a matter of a, of a few miles. And this is great when you're bringing cunt pilots in from all over the world that have different topography. The uh, Swiss pilots or the Norwegian pilots that are interested in mountain flying and how, how might the imagery work in mountains, then you had an opportunity to do that up in the Mount Whitney area, as well as for the Saudi pilots and the Middle East countries that were primarily desert, they could operate over that. And Edwards offered, offered the opportunity. So George Myers picked up on that and he developed a profile so that essentially in one flight, uh, the pilots could evaluate the airplane in all kinds of topography that we show here. Uh, there was actually 19 countries came in to evaluate the RF-5E demo aircraft. They stayed, each pilot stayed for about a week. Uh, most of the pilots had F-5 experience in their own country, but not F-5E. Most of them had been like F-5A pilots. The uh, E model was still fairly new. Uh, however, uh, those that had... Uh, uh, had no experience, went to Williams Air Force Base to get a little bit of F-5 training before they got handed over to George. George then would take them. The first day they'd be kind of, the first couple of days they'd be acclimated in the world of, uh, of the RF-5E. Then George would get them to give them cockpit time. And then later on he would fly two flights with them where he was actually chasing them. This is exactly the model we were to use later as we demonstrated the F-20 to many foreign countries. So he was a precursor on, on making all that work. I think it also speaks well of the uh, F-5E, its simplicity, in that a pilot can come in with very, very little uh, fighter experience and can fly the airplane, be comfortable with the airplane, and safely operate it. George then took the airplane over to Paris. Um, he said that uh, he didn't get to fly directly over the city, that was forbidden, but he did get to do the peripheral road all around. So the oblique cameras that are taking pictures at the side is what a lot of your Paris air shots are taken from. And uh, uh, that, uh, George said, it was 55 hours to ferry it from Palmdale to hop it across the North Atlantic to Paris and back and not one discrepancy the whole time on the airplane. I think that speaks well to Jim Putney and the uh, maintenance crew that were, uh, that were working with that airplane. I think Don Murray was one of the primary flight uh, test engineers on that demo phase. So then comes the production RF-5E. Uh, I hire in in 1982. George Myers left in late of 81. So I essentially was one of the replacements. So uh, Daryl Cornell, who was my boss at the time, hired me in. He said, Roy, you're going to be assigned to the RF-5E. Now, I was a little bummed at first because they had this new project called the F-20. And I was the fourth pilot to be hired behind Paul Mess, Jim Sandberg, Dave Barnes, Chuck Johnson, and then me. So I, I, the, uh, the RF-5E fell to me, and they all got the F-20. So I was a little bummed until I sat down and talked to Howard Ginn, my flight test engineer, as we sat down to start to lay out the program. And Howard said, Roy, this is awesome. We get to do everything with this airplane, performance, flying qualities, systems evaluation, and we do it all under the radar because all the visibility is going to be on the F-20, and we get to do our little project quietly on the side. And boy, he was right. That was super. Let those guys get all the uh, harass and harangue and all the marketing, and we're just quietly doing our thing, producing an airplane. Uh, Daryl uh, Cornell uh, did the first flight. I will say a little word here about me being assigned to the project. Uh, Ron Gibb, who had been working with George Myers, hears that a new pilot is being signed to the uh, RF-5E. And he said, who is it? And they said, well, his name's Roy Martin. He said, well, what's his background? He said, well, I think he's flying a C-141. So uh, right away, Ron goes to Daryl Cornell and said, that is unacceptable. We got a single-seat fighter aircraft, and you got a C-141 pilot flying it? And Daryl said, settle down. The guy fought the war in Vietnam in the F-4. He was an F-5 instructor at Williams Air Force Base. He's been doing testing on the F-5 at Edwards. He's been through test pilot school. I think he'll do okay as your, as your pilot. And Ron said, oh. What about this 141? Say, well, yeah, he's in the reserves right now at Norton flying the 141, but he does have this little background. So after that, uh, Ron says, well, maybe this guy's acceptable. And I think over these years, I've been trying to prove my acceptance to Ron. But anyway, all good. Daryl flew the first flight um, uh, on the flight, and I was a chase. I had a photographer. It was in the Malaysian paint scheme, so you see a lot of RF-5E pictures in the, uh, in the gray uh, camouflage Malaysian paint scheme. Uh, excellent stall characteristics. Being a pilot, I either got to talk with my hands or a model. But this V-nose 
cuts through the air just like the bow of a ship. And the F5, without this, you get kind of these different vortices and the nose starts to, start to wander around at high angle of attack, and it can actually be some issues in the E and the F model with that. But with the recce, this puppy is solid, all the way up, well through the stall condition. And all the pilots that fly the recce say it's the best of the flying F5s. And in fact, Andy Titoriga and uh, uh, Andy Scow pick up on that later, and they then understand that this vortice concept that this RF5E really has good, strong, perfect vortice coming off that nose. And so when they went to the shark nose, kind of had its evolution, if you will, from the RF5E. One of those little known stories there. Uh, the cockpit, excellent layout. It's actually just a standard uh, F5E cockpit, except right at the very top, you'll see a little area with a little thing on top, a little console. And so since there's four stations for four different cameras, you've got four switches, and when you turn them on, a, a light comes on and says the camera's operating. That's pretty cool. And uh, on the left side is how you control the obliques, so whether you're looking to the left or looking to the right. And on the right side, we have some IR uh, capabilities uh, to, to determine what the IR camera is doing. In addition, the, uh, uh, the backup to this thing called V over H that Ron referred to, which is velocity over altitude. And its importance of that is so that the forward motion compensation is correct, so that the camera is operating uh, at the right speed as you're flying, uh, flying along, so that that imagery when it's taken is exactly perfect. We have that over on the left console, as we also have the status for the IR system. So the F5 is a pretty tight con uh, cockpit. We're a little concerned about uh, uh, that that might re restrict vision, but the uh, RF5 had a longer nose, and therefore all this fell within the criteria of you're looking at the nose anyway, so you might as well be looking at this. So anyway, that's a, a very nice layout on the cockpit. In the middle, where normally you'd see the radar scope, that now is a viewfinder, and it's looking out the bottom of the airplane, and I'll talk a little bit about its capabilities, but it was um, a very good system. The um, Issues on flight test, that, uh, some that I can remember. One day I know uh, I'm taking off uh, and I'm uh, looking at my speed coming up 40, 50, 60 knots. And I kind of look outside and I say, you know, being an astute test pilot, I know one thing. I'm going a lot faster than 60 knots. <laughs> so finally I said, this ain't right. And so I abort. And it turned out, data showed later, I'd aborted at 150 knots. And, uh, of course, the airplane's about ready to start to think about lifting off the light on the gear. And, of course, I jam on the brakes and immediately both tires uh, uh, end up with flat spots on the tires. So I'm flunking to a kind of wobbling to a landing and clearing the runway and admitting to the control agency. I think I just uh, flat spotted my tires. And they said, OK, we'll send Jim Putney over right away. And uh, he shows up and he looks down there. And I'd always noticed that in the back of their pickup truck, these maintenance guys had boards with nails. Never did know what that was for. So then they put them down right in front of the tires and had me come forward and intentionally blow the tires because they didn't want a tire to accidentally blow out due to one of these flat spots. And so uh, that was uh, kind of something I thought was kind of unique where you actually intentionally blow the tires so nobody gets hurt. Uh, what had happened? Uh, the very unique system in that, like Ron said, the pedostatic system, very critical on an airplane. By pedostatics, it's what uh, comes in the nose of the airplane sensor. Air data computer gives you your airspeed, your altitude, and that has to be uh, very well taken care of. Now, in the, F, in the uh, F5E model, or the RF5, Ron Gibb and his guys want to have this forward shooting camera called the uh, uh, KS87. It's a framing camera. To load that camera, they would pull the nose forward. So if you pull the nose forward, you're going to break into the pedostatic system. On the demo airplane, they used a little hose, a flexible hose, but you had to be careful that the hose might get pinched when you closed the door. So Ron and Bob Walkie and these guys come up with a system in which you actually, when you pulled the nose forward, you disconnected and shut down the pedostatic system. Then you put your camera in, and when you connected it back in, it would reconnect, and it was a very tight system, and they didn't have to run pedostatic tests using this method. On this particular day, we didn't get a good seat, 
and that's why we had a leak in the pedostatic system, and that's what led to, to the issue. Um, we had an LN33 INS. It was a good INS, and it really helps for doing recce because uh, the name of the game is Ron would have his resolution targets, and you had to do different spacings away at different altitudes so that he could get the data that he wanted. So the INS was a big, big uh, help in making that all happen. The uh, video uh, screen that we had had a camera that looked actually outside the airplane. It was not just video, it was actually what we call near IR, video with near IR. What that meant was it used both video and heat source. So when the sun was starting to set, you still had excellent imagery coming in from this camera because of the IR portion. The price you paid for that, though, that if you went over a bright object on the ground, your scope would kind of bloom up for just a second and then would go away. So if you had a mirror farm on the ground for a solar panel or something, boom, you get these little blooming effects. But we worked with it uh, and, and got those uh, issues uh, minimized. Uh, in the desert environment, it performed great. Uh, and so that's why late, later on we'd have to take it to Malaysia. In the audience we have today, now I was the Northrop pilot assigned the project and the Air Force was given us oversight so we had an Air Force uh, a pilot with us. One day we had a mission when they said they wanted us to use the KA-56 which is the low altitude camera that you have to be like 500 feet over the ground to get the really good imagery uh, that you might want. Uh, they said, we want you to make a run up Mount Whitney, right up the side of Mount Whitney, stand within 500 feet of Mount Whitney all the way up until you clear the top. You know, I looked at that profile and I said, that's a perfect mission for the Air Force pilot. <laughs> so we have with us Mark Steuben. Mark, stand up. There you go. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> so as Mark tells the story, and there's a picture over here of Mount Whitney. So the good news is Mark got the picture. Now, he starts coming up this side of this mountain and he's looking at his video viewfinder and he sees I'm not cleared the mountain. I haven't cleared the mountain. I haven't cleared the mountain. So I haven't gotten the top of Mount Whitney yet. Finally, yeah, I cleared Mount Whitney, except he is out of airspeed. So here he sits wondering if he flops forward, he's going to be looking at Mount Whitney. And if he flops back, he's going to be looking at Lake Owens. And fortunately, it flopped back. And oh, thank you, God, uh, airspeed increasing, and uh, he takes over and recovers the airplane. So uh, he did indicate that was a rather a tense moment, to say the least. <laughs> I'm kind of glad I gave him that sort of thing. They said the same thing happened when the Northrop pilot tried it in a public time. The lesson learned was stick to it, find out all the precursors. They didn't warn him. Yeah, they didn't warn him, that's right. Anyway, the next uh, thing we did then was to take the airplane to Eglin because of uh, hot and humid testing. Um, when I say it was a very well-run deployment, uh, you want to go on a deployment with Ron Gibb. And the reason, Ron was project engineer, and so Ron comes into the team one day and said, you know, we could all go to hotels like we always do and stay in the Holiday Inn. Or it's Eglin, they got beautiful beaches, we're going to be there for a month, why don't we rent condos? since it costs the same, and let's all stay in condos on the beach. Like, woohoo, Ron, you demand. And so that's what we did. And so that made it uh, a very, very enjoyable deployment. It's too bad the systems work pretty good. I'd like to have stayed there longer. Um, we did have one issue with the, uh, that, that we were identified, and that if you persisted at high altitude and cooled the system down, did a, a very high speed to low altitude, the moisture in the air would fog up on the sides of the windows, on the inside of the windows uh, where the cameras are trying to shoot through fog. So you've all done, you've seen your glasses fog up sometimes when you get in cold air, same thing. And uh, so again, Mr. Walkie and Mr. Gibb get to work and they design these little camera, or little uh, fans, and these fans would spew air across the side of the window and keep the air moving and that solved the problem. So it worked out pretty good. He mentioned that we had limited support there at Eglin. We actually had pretty good support. Um, Ron was worried, oh man, we're low priority. Uh, are we gonna get the chance to put the resolution targets where we want? Are we gonna get a chance to do the runs? So it's the first day at Eglin. The whole Northrop team is in the room and in walks the project officer for Eglin that's gonna be our liaison to see that we get our resources. This liaison is Major Leslie Kenny. She later became General Leslie Kenny. She was the first woman to, uh, flight test engineer to go through the test pilot school, and she was my classmate. 
So years ago when I went through test pilot school. So when she walks in, I said, oh, cool, Les is our, our, our uh, liaison. So I go up in the front room and give her a big hug. And Ron says, you know, if my test pilot is hugging the liaison, this may be going to work out okay. <laughs> so, anyway, it was a great uh, test. Uh, then Ron comes up one day and says, hey, Roy, I want you to overfly Los Angeles Olympics. It's like, oh, really? You know, like, that's not high enough visibility. Um, it's not, of course, as bad as it is today with the 9-11 issues, but back in those days, a lot of coordination required with L.A., uh, the airplane was chased by Chuck Johnson in the F-5F, and that's why we do have, it had a photographer in the back, I think it was Dan Koblosh, so that's why we have the imagery that you see of the airplane over the Olympics. Uh, I set it up with LA that we would come in uh, below 18,000, so it's 17.5, and I would set a dive up to 7,500, to, to recover at 7,500 feet, so the dive was to get the forward-looking KS-87 uh, uh, frame camera to get a good shot, and then we pulled off level to be able to get the panoramic cameras so that they could get a nice shot. And so the Olympics you see there, I think it's the last day or next to the last day, and we got the hammer throw and the 400 meter hurdles going on, so if you want to know. Anyway, that's it. And uh, you can kind of see the hurdles on the track if you look at them real close there. Um, Monday. So uh, I take the airplane into Saudi. I'm going to talk a little bit about in-country training in a minute. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, so we, uh, um, and then, uh, first of all, I took the airplane to Malaysia. We trained those pilots, come back, did some Saudi work with their airplanes, took their airplanes to Saudi, trained their pilots on the basic RF-5E, came back, and then comes the LORAP system. Now, LORAP, long-range oblique photography, Ron's talked about it, just to kind of, so you'll understand, you've seen people run around with these big, long, telescopic lenses on their camera. This camera had a five, it, it's like as if you had a, it's a 60 inch lens. That's meant you, if you had a five foot long telescope sticking out the side of the airplane, that's what this camera would be capable of doing. But what uh, Recon Optical did is they, rather than have a big tube sticking out the side of your airplane, they take the imagery in and they just bounce it back and forth with mirrors. So Ron Gibb really does do it with mirrors. Anyway, back and forth, back and forth, and uh, uh, until it reaches 60 inches and then they print the film. But again, this requires temperature control to be perfect, that the stability of the uh, camera in the nose has to be very stable to get the kind of imagery. So when he's talking about seeing an object 50 miles away one foot long. Think about that. Looking 50 miles away. I mean, if you look at 50 miles, you can tell whether it's a Ford or a Chevy. It's just incredible. That's the kind of capability. You know that this is a lower up because it's got one, one window on each side, and it's a framing camera. So it takes a picture, takes a picture, takes a picture, takes a picture. So this is 20 miles, 40 miles, 60 miles, 80 miles. And then as you fly along, it recycles. Pip, pip, pip and then recycles, and so you lay out this whole imagery. And so when Ron says in the Gulf War, Schwarzkopf liked it, they knew everything on day one of the war because this LORAP had gone through and documented every item along the border of Iraq all the way up to about 80 miles. So on day one of the war, they knew every gun emplacement that there was all the way along there. Amazing capability, amazing camera, love it. The uh, flight testing, uh, the problem with the camera, uh, this. Uh, 670 pounds, I think he said. A typical F5 flies at about 15 to 20 percent mean aerodynamic cord, and it'll rotate at about 150, 155 knots and get airborne. Typical F5. This airplane, with that much weight in the nose, was at 5 percent mean aerodynamic cord, by far the most forward of any F5. And as a pilot, you have to be patient because you can put that stick back on takeoff if you want, but it ain't going to rotate till you get to 175 knots, and then it'll finally rotate and fly. Um, I was a little worried about that. Um, but Hank Shoto had told me once, any F-5 will fly, Roy. You just got to get it going fast enough. So this is another one of those cases. <laughs> Even with the F-5F ballast uh, in the rear, we still had that uh, issue. And, of course, upon landing, boom, that nose is coming down. You don't get the vote. When we're doing the testing, 
you like to know exactly where your target is so in testing so that you know when to turn the cameras on, get the picture, turn the camera off, and, be, and then turn around and do it again back and forth and be very efficient. Well, these objects are out there like 50, 60, 70 miles away, these little tiny resolution targets. There's no way you're going to see them. So it really helps if you've got a large dominant object that you can physically see with your naked eye. And so that's what we did. Out there at Edwards on the distant hill by China Lake, there's a radar station and it's a big white dome and you can see it even over Edwards. You look out, you can see this big dome. So we put the resolution target just down below that dome so that I could see exactly, okay, turn the camera on, get the pictures, turn the camera off, turn around, come back, do it back and forth. Very much contributed to our test efficiency. And I teach at the test pilot school uh, some courses there now. And uh, this is one of the things I like to teach. And if you're gonna do long range photography testing, have a dominant object out there next to your resolution target so you can uh, be very efficient when you do this. Ron comes along one day and says, hey Roy, I want you to make a run from Santa Barbara to San Diego and the back. And it was one of these very beautiful clear days you get 70 miles plus visibility and uh, uh, and so this contributed to significant documentation of the Pacific region all along there I kind of wondered what he was going to do with that I think what he did though rumor has it that he knew the lat long of all the vice president's homes and he took this imagery and on Monday morning all the VPs had a picture of their home on their desk. He didn't bring that up. But anyway, that's uh, Ron's way of keeping the money coming, you know. So there we go. It works. Um, off to Saudi then. Um, Saudi configuration of the airplane had an air refueling probe. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, and, and, and that's two stories I want to tell from that. So you're, a lot of you are familiar with the F5 and the fact that you have a transfer tube from the tank and then here sticks your probe so you can hit a basket, a, um, a basket uh, for probe and drogue refueling. Well, the Saudis, uh, when they were using the C-130 and we tested this airplane against the 130 and, and it was fine for uh, refueling on the 130. The 130's max speed for refueling was 220 knots. Our min speed was 220 knots, but we were able to do that fine. However, the Saudis bought the F-15 and the F-15 needed to refuel at uh, 300 knots. So the Saudis bought from Boeing the KE-3 tanker. Now, a KE-3, uh, you know, you've seen that airplane with the big rotodome on top. That's an E-3. It's a 707-720 modified. So Boeing modified a 707-720, put a tanker uh, 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 pro, uh, receptacle on the F-15 so that they could have a probe and receptacle uh, scenario like the Air Force concept of refueling. And so that was very important that the Saudis get the F-15 and this tanker uh, available to them in country to refuel the F-15. Now the question is, so how are we going to refuel the F-5s? So Beach comes up with this little pod to put on the wingtips. And this pod is our air refueling pod that comes out with a hose about 50 feet long and it has a basket. Now the normal basket for refueling is made out of fabric so it doesn't damage the nose of an airplane if it hits it. But at 300 knots, that fabric basket collapses and you can't get the probe in there. So Beach's solution was, let's build a metal basket. So that way the basket will stay open when you come in there. So now you see the story. You've got a a probe on the wingtip of a, of, a, of a big airplane and when that wing starts to oscillate in any kind of turbulence, that hose starts to oscillate, that metal basket is sitting there saying, if you think you're man enough to come in and fence with me, you come right ahead. So we, uh, we fought against this thing. Harry Walker was the uh, pilot that I think had replaced uh, Mark at this point or uh, in the process as an Air Force pilot. He and I went up. We scratched noses. We scratched windscreens. We knocked off AOA probes. We did a lot of damage to F-5s trying to make this thing work. And we finally declared it unacceptable and sent our report to the Pentagon. Now, just because you sent an unacceptable report to the Pentagon, there are other forces in play, right? The program manager had promised the Saudis this airplane, this, this, this thing would be in Saudi Arabia ready to go in October, and here it is July, and we're declaring it unacceptable. 
And I think that report just kind of got thrown in the trash, the airplane got sent to Saudi, and it's used even to this day. And if you look at the Saudi F-5s, there's a lot of damage to some of those noses over there. Anyway, uh, that's the way things are done. It's another lesson I teach to my young test pilots. Hey, your job is to evaluate and report and be honest. It's up to program managers to determine uh, what's really going to happen in the end game on this thing. The other uh, rather interesting thing about an air refueling probe is a uh, I had to take the F5 Lorop version out to its max speed um, uh, for an F5, which is 710 knots equivalent. And I'd been there with a horizontal tail made out of composite that we had tested, and, uh, and that was no problem. So I sat down with Ernie Evans, our flight test engineer, and we said, I tell you what, Ernie, I'll go ahead and I'll start doing the dive, and then uh, whenever I get on, on data point, you go ahead and I'm gonna do a pitch wrap to excite the structural mode. You say it's looking good. I'll do a roll wrap to excite the torsional mode. It looks good. You clear me, I'll do a pitch sweep and uh, let the exciters that are out on the wingtips excite the structure, and then I'll do the other one for the asymmetric, and it will come out a burner and RTB. He said, okay. So to get out the 710 knots equivalent on an F5, what do you have to do? 45,000 feet, 1.2 Mach, 60 degree dive, full afterburner, 25,000 feet, you start a 3G pull. If you do it perfect, at about 20,000 feet, you hit 710 knots equivalent speed. You then ride that line down, and while you're descending down, holding speed, you're doing these inputs, okay? So I'm gonna input, get a clearance, do an input, get a clearance. Well, I start the dive with this air refueling probe, and suddenly it starts to get noise. The aerodynamic noise from this pro probe at high speed was just horrendous. And all I hear is <laughs> I can't hear any radio, I can't hear anything. So here I am sitting at 710 knots equivalent, and as I asked my young test pilots, what would you do? Safety says, okay, it didn't work as planned, come out of burner, let's recover, let's go back and think about it. But you know, you got to make a decision as a test pilot. And I said, it was hard to get here. I really don't want to come back here. Here we go. It's either going to hold together or not. So I did the pitch input, held together. Did the roll, it held together. I shot the sweeps for pitch, still hanging together. Did the torsional, <laughs> it's all together. Power back RTB, life is good. But it could have come apart, you know, I mean, you never know. But the bottom line is, those are the decisions you have to make. We had no idea that that noise from that probe aerodynamically was gonna be an influence. So it's kind of an, uh, one of those interesting things. All right, let's talk about in-country training. Uh, initially in Malaysia, we trained at Butterworth Air Base, uh, which is uh, near Penang, Malaysia, and uh, uh, a nice place to, uh, to, to be in to test, except the humidity obviously is pretty high. Um, at the same time, the Aussies were operating there with F-111s, and so uh, we had a lot of good support that, from them. The typical way I would uh, do this is we would do the country, we would say, give us your four of your best F5E instructor pilots. We're going to make them our F5E pilots. We'd run them through a uh, two-week academic course, and then we'd run them through training where I would uh, chase them. They would fly the RF5E. I would chase them in one of their airplanes, one of their F5s. And then uh, after all the four pilots had been trained, we'd turn the program over to an Air Force pilot to stay in country for continuation reconnaissance training. So that's typically how we work. So we're supposed to work pretty good, except we start to deliver these F5Es into uh, Saudi. And uh, I went through the two-week academic course, and that's good. We're getting ready to fly one for the first pilot. I come into work that morning, and, uh, and the, uh, they said, the mission's canceled. I said, really? Something wrong with the plane? I said, nope. Uh, the life support equipment doesn't have anything in there. There's no life raft. There's no life support equipment in the seat. When you guys delivered the F-5, Northrop took your stuff away, there's nothing in there. I said, okay, this is easy. Go to the F-5F, that's your equipment, pull it out, put it in the E model, let's go fly. Can't do that. Okay. Next day I come in, mission's canceled. Why? No life support equipment. It's like, how long is this gonna last? So finally I go to the wing commander and I say, we got a problem here, you know, we gotta get this thing fixed. So it turned out what had happened was, the airplanes had arrived into Taif, Saudi Arabia. The life support shop sergeant, life support officer, I should say, looks around. He sees 10 F5Es arriving, or F5Es. He looks at his manning. He sees no increase in his manning. 
So he says, I'm not going to support 10 more airplanes. I don't have enough people. And so that's it. You stop. And it's like, whoa, okay. So the wing commander then called Riyadh. Riyadh then got an additional slot assigned to the Taif life support office. All the guy wanted was an additional slot. The next day, he takes the bag out of the F-5F, puts it in the F-5E, we go for our F-5E and we go fly. So there you go. So different air forces around the world operate in different ways. And the fact that a life support shop could shut down a training was, uh, I thought was rather, was rather unique there. <laughs> anyway, um, we trained the group there um, and got, the, got, 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 the, uh, got, got their RF-5E pilots all trained up in the basic airplane and then later I went back for the lower op training. Now, to get the airplanes over to these countries, both the F-5 and the RF-5, we started doing ferry flights. And this happened just a little bit after I hired in. Now, there's kind of a history behind ferry flights in that uh, mostly the airplanes, initially when I was a brand new F-5E pilot at Willie, we did ferry flights of F-5s to Saudi and Iran. And then uh, the Air Force started breaking them down and putting them on C-5s. And most of the F-5s were delivered to foreign countries on C-5s and put together, and then an FCF in country, and then the airplane turned over to the, uh, to, to, to the country. But then, uh, in about uh, 80, uh, 83, uh, Morocco hires a little company called Phoenix Corporation uh, to hire pilots to ferry the airplane from Palmdale to Morocco. And... Um, when those airplanes arrived, they, what, they just used Navy, uh, Navy uh, uh, aggressor pilot, or adversary pilots to, uh, that were on leave, and these guys saw a chance to make extra money, so they show up at Palmdale, jump in and off they go, ferrying these airplanes. But they arrived in Morocco, very bad condition. You know, the airplanes looked terrible. The cockpits were all cluttered with maps and charts, and there was even evidence that the engines had been fodded. And TV Jones heard that his beautiful F-5s were arriving in this country in crap condition. And he said, that stops right now. So he said, from now on, every sale of every F-5 is going to have a $100,000 line item, and we will promise we will deliver that airplane to your door, and Northrop will do it. And so from that point on, we got in the ferry business. And this is how it worked. Uh, and we used the same model George Myers had used when he took the airplane to Paris. We went on the wing of a Gulfstream a G2 or a Learjet, the company aircraft. All we had was UHF radio, which was not going to be good enough to operate the, throughout the, the, to get these airplanes delivered. So the corporate jet did all the communication and navigation, and we just uh, flew on the wing. Uh, boy, a lot of coordination, a lot of visas, a lot of overflight clearances, a lot of hotels, taxis, very very uh, rugged thing to do. Uh, delivered in both day, night, all weather conditions. We pretty much didn't stop as long as we had the range of the weather while we would go. Um, if you talk to a uh, Met, Sandberg, Martin, Chuck Johnson, Brent Barker, they'll all tell you probably the most dangerous thing we did <laughs> was ferry airplanes because of some of the, the weather and the stuff we had to go through. Um, and it's also some of the most interesting flying. Uh, but our motto was quite simple, no bet, metal, all else is rubbish. And that's based on uh, the Red Baron's motto, which was Pipper on the target, all else is rubbish. And so we kind of adapted his model. As long as we didn't bend any metal along the way and got that airplane delivered looking good, we'd met our requirements. So this is the ferry route that starts in Palmdale. 19 hops to get the thing to Singapore, for example. Uh, and so both the F5Es and the F5Fs were delivered along this way. The most critical leg was Goose Bay. Labrador to Sondestrom, Greenland, 870 miles. If you had more than a 10-knot headwind, you weren't going to make it. And the bad news about Sondestrom, you're either landing at Sondestrom or you're bailing out. And when you bail out, it's over the North Atlantic, which is very cold up there, a lot of icebergs. So uh, uh, we had, a, with an F-5, we always said at 1,000 miles, you'd better be looking at concrete. You know, and that's kind of the way it was. But uh, that leg was the most critical. Uh, there was a lot of issues you can't even think about. Like when you land in Delhi, India, you got to pay the agent in American money. You got to buy gas using traveler's checks and you got to pay the landing fees in rupee. So you got to go run off to a bank, find rupee. So everybody's got their own little criteria. These are just in a sample of the my rate of things you get into when you get into worldwide delivery of airplanes. Not an easy task. So the fact that we delivered over 100 F5Es or our F5Es combination and had no bent metal, we're pretty proud of that. 
Okay, the final testing I did was uh, with the F5, my final association really with the RF5, I mean, was the, uh, the introduction of the INS GPS. The um, F5 itself um, had the LN33, and uh, the day that Ron and I arrived at Riyadh headquarters to in-brief the uh, commander of the Saudis uh, that we were going to install these INS GPSs, that we were there to do that in, this, uh, in these RF5Es to, to swap out, um, was kind of an interesting day in that uh, this commander, we were with the Air Force, U.S. Air Force was there with us, and they walk in, we sit down to this meeting, and immediately this RSAF commander starts just really chewing out this Air Force guy about lack of support in some of the areas. And uh, he, he has this tirade for about 10 minutes, and Ron and I are looking at each other like, oh boy, this isn't going well. So then he uh, finally turns to uh, Ron, and he said, so why are you here? And Ron says, we're here to brief you on this new INS GPS. And he turns to me and says, so what good is that? I said, well, the LN-33 after an hour is about, it could be as much as a mile off. The LN-33 will be 100 feet off. He said, really? I said, yeah, it's continuously updated with the GPS. It's the latest and greatest. And your pilots will be able to use it for precise navigation all the time. And he, boy, after that, he welcomed us. Like, we turned that meeting around and uh, uh, what support do you need to make this happen? Now, the initial design of this INS GPS is kind of interesting from a pilot's perspective in that uh, uh, we adopted a uh, uh, Honeywell 764 who built the basic INS GPS. The interface to the pilot was built by Rockwell Collins, and they had used it on a uh, German airplane that uh, had been a submarine, uh, anti-submarine warfare aircraft. So a navigator, it was designed for a navigator to use, kind of a very complicated system. And I sat down and looked at, started working it a little bit on the little prototem uh, that we had, and I said, there's no way a single seat fighter, fighter pilot can operate this, it's just too complicated. We've got to get it to look more like the basic Saudi system that they're used to. But Aziz Satani, who is in charge of the Northrop Grumman avionics, comes to me and he said, Roy, we're putting this system in the F-5. Don't do your normal thing of trying to change it. It's going to cost money. Adapt it the way it is and get it in there. You're off to a meeting with Rockwell Collins, Honeywell, and you at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay, Aziz, I got it. So I go in there and sit down at this meeting, and there's an engineer from uh, Honeywell, an engineer from Rockwell Collins, myself, and then some uh, management people uh, sitting around on the back. And uh, I set up, I started out by briefing what the mission was that this airplane was going to have to be used at. Right away, the Honeywell guy says, the interface from Rockwell Collins isn't going to work, is it? I said, not in its current concept. So we started right there at that point in time at 10 o'clock in the morning redesigning this interface unit, and by 4 o'clock it was done. It just showed me if you get exactly the right people in exactly the right place that have the smarts and intelligence, you can do an awful lot of work in a short period of time. And in one day, we redesigned the interface for the INS GPS and made it user-friendly for the Saudi pilots. And I thought that was just amazing to see. Now, we also had bean counters behind, and whenever we said, well, I'd like to have this, guy would say, that's expensive. Okay, well, we really don't need that, you know. So we just had the right people in the meeting. The bad news is the Honeywell guy was a chain smoker. And, man, he's just chain smoking like crazy. And the more he's into it, the more he's smoking, and the rest of us are like dying from secondary smoking at least. But anyway, that's <laughs> It works. So then we finally uh, do take the system in country. It's not my favorite thing to do to test in country because the engineers at Northrop are asleep when you're having troubles in Saudi Arabia. So uh, there's a lot of back and forth trying to understand issues and uh, uh, Ron was there with me and so we would keep Ron up all night to talk to the uh, engineers back at Northrop while I'd get some sleep and then the next day he would he would report the issues and and and, and together as a team uh, it worked really great so uh, we did get it working and that's uh, currently what's in their uh, uh, what's in their things just to show you an issue of a problem that you have when you're in country so we have this INS GPS and I was told it'd have a tenth of a mile at worst case error when you first powered it up so I'm uh, powering this thing up, and I'm looking at the coordinates on the revetment at Saudi in Taif, and I'm looking at the coordinates of the INS GPS, and they're a mile off. 
So I get the Honeywell engineer over and I says, something's wrong. He says, nope. He gets his independent GPS out and he says, nope, the coordinates are exactly right. Hmm. Well, I said, something's wrong because uh, those are the coordinates on the revetment. And that's what the pilots are going to be uh, expecting when they align. So we go into the ops officer and I said, just kind of wonder where'd you get those coordinates? He said, what? I said, the ones on the revetment. Oh, he said, those revetments used to be F-15 revetments. They got new revetments. That was a mile down the ramp. We moved the revetments to here. <laughs> it's like, oh, you moved the revetments, but you didn't change the coordinates. So anyway, just kind of wanted to give you a little flavor about what you get into there with some of that kind of testing. I can only say that I am so delighted to um, have had the opportunity to have been a test pilot on this project, working with the Bob Walkies, the Ron Gibbs, the uh, Howard Ginn flight test engineer, Don Murray's, um, and just everybody uh, uh, along the way was just fantastic. Uh, great system. It proved its worth, especially in the Gulf War, and I'm very, very proud of the airplane for uh, its contribution that it did there. What makes uh, an onboard reconnaissance system what it is, like an F-5, it's internal in the nose, it's very stable. A lot of tactical commanders say, oh, heck with it, we'll just hang it on the pod of an F-16. No, you don't get the stability to get the kind of resolution Ron was talking about when you've got something hanging out there on a pylon. There's just too much vibration and it's just too hard to do. So that's why when Ron says this is one of the last great systems, it's because of, of, of that uh, Northrop design. Uh, my thanks to Cindy for allowing us to come here and give this presentation and capture the RF-5E story. I hope you've enjoyed it. We have a little video now that uh, Ron had put together and I'd like to show that now. So, thank you. This uh, video is an old VHS that was done for the Paris Air Show. Uh, this, is, uh, this does not have any sound so I'm going to narrate it. This is the first flight of the RF-5E with Derek Cornell, uh, the Malaysia aircraft. And uh, in this configuration, we had three windows without an IR line scanner door. Picture from the chase airplane. And this is the uh, picture from the Learjet with the periscope for a down low altitude. And then the landing of the aircraft. This shows the window of the forward oblique and the pedostatic line sticking out. Uh, two latches to slide the nose forward. And then the KS-87 with the thousand foot film magazine. And the nice thing about this aircraft uh, was everything was pretty much at uh, shoulder height, arm height. Uh, you can see the prism uh, in the window and then these are the access doors on the side. Four push button latches to get to the film quickly. And then four latches on each magazine to remove it. And these magazines are all common with the RF-4C, uh, so a uh, common inventory item. The 87 and the 56 flew in the RF-4C. And this is the uh, magazine for the IRLAN scanner. That's the K-56 magazine. The, wind, the window glass was uh, three quarters of an inch thick, and it was it was uh, uh, made just like a lens. It was a very precision window. We had to make a rod that would hold the door open in a 60 knot wind in a hurricane. So it was it was a big heavy steel stainless steel rod. This is the pallet coming out. There's four bolts on each side. Uh, holding the uh, pallet in the aircraft. And all those white tie straps are just for flight test instrumentation, so wires to measure uh, temperatures. And it wouldn't be in the production aircraft. K-56. and the IR line scanner. The IR line scanner was sensitive to two-tenths of a degree centigrade. 
a very, very sensitive uh, system. Different coverages. So you could download the pallet one, and you could have pallet two already all checked out in the lab and roll that out, uh, put it in place, and then bring the hoist up and lift it up into place. So. And then the IR line scanner door would come off, and uh, you can see uh, in the window. So having the K-56 on both pallets, the, flight, the pilot could either do high altitude, medium altitude, or low altitude. So. Say again? How much is it uh, About 500 pounds. And you can see the fans on the windows that Roy was talking about to help with the defog, get mass airflow across the window. Here's a picture of the cockpit with a viewfinder display. And you can see the uh, nose wheel gear. And then this is the left-hand console control panel with the velocity and input, altitude input, and then the heads-up display. Picture on the ground, looking through the viewfinder. And it had a zoom lens on it, so you could go wide angle. And here's some in-flight imagery. If you were doing a mapping around and you need to look directly under the aircraft, allow you to line up the aircraft uh, to get the accuracy that you needed on the map. So. Is that the same as the voice side for the camera? Did you find it? Uh, no. The the question was, uh, did that bore sight the cameras? And it's a separate system. So. Okay. So that's that's the film. Uh, just one thing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the wall. There's an inboard profile over here, of the whole airplane, a fifth scale drawing. There's a full skies drawing of the nose. Uh, there's actual image sizes of the of the negatives over there. The 60, 60, uh, the K93 with the 40, uh, with the 60 inch uh, negative size. A couple of pictures of uh, Yosemite, uh, the Olympic shot, and uh, and then there's uh, the sunset, the strip at uh, Las Vegas, before all the buildings were built, <laughs> and then Disneyland. So. So you're welcome to look at it if you have any questions and give me a call. Uh, I guess we can take questions for me and then we can have Roy come up and take questions. The question was how do we maintain the temperature for the scanner? We didn't need to because it could not look at any structure. It, it, uh, it was measuring whatever the temperature radiated from the ground, that's what it was measuring. So, so it was not critical how, what the temperature, because it was cryogenically cooled by the, with a pump. So. It was operating at liquid nitrogen temperatures.
the question is, are we still supporting the Saudis today? And Northrop is supporting them. Uh, they retired the Air 5 fleet uh, in 2008 uh, and then turned around and put it right back into service. I was over there for the retirement ceremony, uh, but it didn't last very long. So they're, they're still, and, and they're more interested in Yemen than they are in anything else. So, but, uh, yeah, the question is the environment more difficult today. Yes, it is. So I, I'm glad I'm not going back there anymore. I spent a lot of time in Saudi. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad to be here right, right now. So, so the uh, ITAR issues, ITAR stands for what kind of information you can pass to a foreign country, much more restrictive now than it was then. And you got to be real careful now about what you tell a foreign country or you can go to jail. <laughs> so anyway, or you can be charged for that. So that's what makes the more difficult environment. All the lower ups are black, uh, and uh, I don't know the true story. I heard that uh, uh, they had an SR-71 that they saw, and they said, well, this is going to be our spy plane, so we're going to make it black. But there's been, I, I don't know, really know the true story as why it was black. But I tell you, 120 degrees in Saudi with a black airplane, that's the wrong color. <laughs> and every one of them looked like they'd been through a war. I mean, they are faded so badly. They've never repainted them. Uh, I don't know exactly. I think there were four, four blacks. So. The question was how many blacks airplanes are there? So, so. Pretty much all reconnaissance. Well, because of the low light level, you know, you can take imagery at low light level with, with the sensors. Uh, they're extremely versatile and they're real time. And, you know, you've got uplinks to satellites and, and you're looking at uh, videos in real time. But uh, the... The digital cameras are not anywhere near this type of resolution, so uh, the issue with digital is the, the pixels are, are getting small, but they're getting so small they don't have much light gathering capability, so they don't have as good low light level as some of the older cameras. So. But uh, uh, the advantage of, of film is you've got microscopic silver halides that are, are gathering light, and they're, they're they're very small in resolution, and they give you this type of image. Kodak had spent many years on this film. This is a special film uh, that allows you to get uh, very high resolution. So. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.